What a blessing it is for us to be able to assemble together again this Lord's Day to open our hearts and to offer up praise and worship unto God and now to open up His Word and consider another portion of it, its meaning and its application to our lives. I want to encourage you to have your Bible out. Open up to the book of 1 Peter chapter 5. We're going to look at verse 12 in just a moment as we get started with our study. We're going to talk about grace this evening. Grace is a subject that we hear a lot of our religious friends and neighbors talk about. They're very confident about it. They speak about it a lot, and it seems as if we want to talk about baptism. Or at least that's what it appears like when we're talking with our friends, especially sharing with them what one has to do in order to be saved. And there seems to be a contrast between grace and, and works. And that can be frustrating to us. So let's delve into some of that this evening and take a look at, at how it is the Bible teaches that you and I are saved by grace. Peter is writing this first epistle. And he's writing it to Christians who are already suffering terribly for their faith. And he writes to tell them that it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. The fiery trial is going to get worse, but you stay with it. You stay with what you know to be the truth. As he draws the epistle to a close, he writes, By Silvanus, our faithful brother, as I consider him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying, that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. You have the true grace of God. Keep it. Stand in it, do not let it go. Now when Peter speaks of the true grace of God, that must mean that in his day and in his time, there were some false concepts of grace. There were some false concepts and false teachings of grace that were beginning to spread. And, and his readers, those, those who were receiving this letter, were either accused of standing in a false grace or they were fearful that they had a false grace. But I, I want us to look at that phrase, the true grace of God. Unfortunately, we are living in a time in which false grace abounds. Again, as we talk with our religious friends and neighbors around about us, we hear them talking about grace. And we hear them talk about grace quite often, sometimes to the, to the point that we're ready to, okay, you can have grace. You can have that subject. And that's not a good thing for us to do, brethren. It's never a good thing for us to surrender any truth of Scripture, any Bible doctrine to those who are not standing in the truth, standing in the, the, the true message of God's Word. Grace is a Bible subject, and we need to know it, and we need to understand it, and we need to stand firm within it. But sometimes when we shy away from a subject because it is controversial or because it is difficult, when we do that as Bible students or when we do that as preachers or teachers and elders, that creates a vacuum because there is some curiosity. Here's a Bible subject. What's the truth on this subject? And if we're not going to the Scriptures and getting that truth or we're not hearing it from the pulpit, then our curiosity, we're going to look for answers in other places. And if we're not careful, we can have false concepts of grace and false understandings of what the Bible has to say about this subject. Grace is a Bible subject. We are not to dismiss it. We are not to shy away from it. We are not to surrender it to others. God has revealed the meaning of grace, what grace consists of, and what it means to Christians. And we need to learn what the Bible says about grace. And we need to be content with what the Bible says about grace. Because any other understanding than the Scriptures will result in a false grace. What is grace? Well, I'll begin by saying what it is not. Grace is not a mystical, mysterious, better felt than told extension of God's being that takes on a life of its own within our lives. 
And I've heard grace described that way and explained that way by some people I've been trying to study with. That, that grace is something that we really can't understand. It's just overpowering. It's just something that comes from God and it takes over in our lives. That's not what the Bible says about grace. I think most of us, we have our handy, easy definition for grace ready to use, right? Grace is unmerited favor. Grace is when God has shown favor to us. He has given us something that we don't deserve. If that's the understanding of grace, and I believe it is, the, the concept that I have, the idea that I have about grace is grace is a gift. Grace is when God gives us something not because we have earned it and we tell God you owe us and not because we're deserving of it and we we stand expecting to receive it but grace is when God gives us something simply because it pleases him to give it that's the proper understanding of grace and and really anything that God gives us could fall under that category Anything that God gives us, He gives us life, He extends us our, our life, He gives us a good day, He gives us spiritual blessings. All of those are gifts of God's grace. But when we talk about God's grace, so often the subject that comes to the forefront is salvation. And indeed, that is a gift of God's grace. But there are some misconceptions about how that works. How is it that God saves us by grace how is it that he keeps us saved by his grace i want to take a look at three errors that are taught that are held that are believed by religious friends and neighbors perhaps these are beliefs that we've encountered as we've been trying to study and talk with people maybe they're even beliefs that we used to have in the past and we realized they were wrong we studied our way out of them or maybe just maybe one of these would be a belief that you still have today. I want to take a look at what the Bible has to say about how we are saved by God's grace. Number one, God's grace offers us salvation, but it must be received on God's terms. There's no doubt that God, through His grace, offers us salvation. It is not something that we earn. It's not something that we deserve. But as a gift, it has to be received on God's terms. In the book of Ephesians, at chapter 2, verses 7 through 9, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 7 through 9, and if you're talking with someone about what to do in order to be saved, and you bring up uh, repentance, confession, and baptism, and they recoil at that idea because that is a work and we're saved by grace through faith, not of works, well, you're going to be reminded of this passage. Many of us have been taken to this passage when talking with people about becoming a Christian, about what you have to do to be saved. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 7 through 9, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. I want to pause right here, and I want to make this very clear. I believe every word of these verses, every word of these verses is true. And, and this passage doesn't belong to somebody else. Brethren, this is our passage. This is our truth, and we need to cling to it. And we need to understand it. We need to understand exactly what it is teaching. Salvation is by grace. And the text even says here in verse 8 that it is the gift of God. And that gift is access, not through works of which I can boast. That is, not, not through me jumping through hoops, not through, by me contriving my own way of how I can be righteous before God, blazing my own trail to heaven, or some have the idea of salvation working like this. I've committed sin. I've done that which is wrong. Now I've got to do enough good things to tip the scales in my favor. 
And if I can do enough good things, then what have I done? I've earned salvation. And Paul says, no, it does not work that way. If we're saved at all, we're saved as a gift that is given to us by God. However, just like any other gift, it has to be received in order to be enjoyed. And it has to be received on the terms of the one who is offering it. Back in 1996, my wife and I lived in Kansas City for a year. And the thing I love about that year that we lived in Kansas City, that's, that's where our daughter was born. And so that's a very special year to us, a very special time to us. But during that year that we lived there, I discovered Sports Talk Radio. Maybe a few guys here have set up. Yeah, Sports Talk Radio. And I enjoyed listening to that. And, and one afternoon as I was listening to Don Fortune on that Sports Talk Radio, I called in. I called in and I got through on air. And I got to talk to him on air. And that was really something, for me, that was really something exciting. And so as the segment was ending, they're about to go to commercial. He says, stay on the line. Our producer wants to talk to you. Okay. So I stayed on the line, and the producer came on and said, listen, because you got through on the air, you have won two free dinners. And he told me of the restaurant and, and said, now here's the thing. He took my name, and he said, we've written your name on an envelope, and we put these tickets for these free dinners they're here at the office. All you have to do is come downtown and pick up these tickets, and you can have this dinner. That was 26 years ago. I have yet to enjoy that free dinner. Because in that day, at that time, telling me to go downtown in Kansas City, it wasn't worth it for a free dinner. I grew up out in the country. I didn't grow up in the Metroplex. I was overwhelmed by two lanes of traffic, yet alone five or six going in one direction. And these tall buildings, forget it. So it was given to me. Those, those free dinners were given to me, but I never enjoyed them because I never went and picked them up. Salvation is offered freely to everyone but it has to be received on the terms of the one who is giving it. And that's Jesus Christ. He is the author of eternal salvation. He has the right to tell us what we have to do, what conditions we have to meet. Well, well we have faith in this passage, that we're saved by grace through faith, and, and that all we have to do is believe. No, the faith that Paul is talking about here requires more than just mental assent. We know the Bible teaches that saving faith does not negate works. And we can go to James chapter 2 and prove that. And I won't read the entirety of James chapter 2, verse 14 through 26. In this entire section, James talks about how faith without works is dead. And that faith has to be moved to obedience and has to be expressed in works of obedience in order to save. But I will read three verses, three consecutive verses that make some important points about how faith does not negate works of obedience. Notice in verse 20, But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Works of obedience makes our faith alive. Look at the next verse. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? That word justified is a legal term. It is the equivalent of the judge banging down the gavel and saying, not guilty. And, and how is it that our faith justifies us? How is it that our faith causes God to say, not guilty of sin? It's when our faith is expressed in works of obedience. So, uh, so works of obedience makes our faith alive, causes our faith to justify us. And verse 22, uh, verse 22, yes, do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect or complete or mature? 
Our faith is not made perfect. It's not perfected. It's not complete. It's not mature before God until God sees that that faith is moving us to meet conditions that He sets before us. So works causes our faith to be alive, to justify us, to be perfected. Faith without works is dead. We receive salvation when our faith acts by doing things Christ has said we must do. So saving faith does not negate works, and grace does not negate conditions. Again, I've talked with individuals, and they say, if you do anything, that negates grace. If you do anything, then that takes grace off the table, and it's no longer by grace. You're saving yourself. God's grace doesn't work that way. Grace does not negate conditions. Noah was saved by grace. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7. Just turn back a few pages from James 2. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. Here's Noah's verse in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11 and at verse 7, By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to the faith. Notice that Noah had to meet conditions, didn't he? Noah had to build an ark. Would Noah have been saved if he hadn't built an ark? No, he wouldn't have. But, but where is grace in this? Well, here, here's Noah building an ark and earning his salvation. Where is the grace? Well, Genesis chapter 6 and verse 8 says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So grace is there. Grace, is not, grace didn't just show up in the New Testament. You don't open up to John chapter 1 and, and grace says, I'm here, Whew, sorry I'm late. No. Grace has been in the Bible all along. It's here in the Old Testament. It's here with Noah. So where does grace come in here in verse 7? Being divinely warned of things not seen. That warning to Noah was a gift from God, wasn't it? That the flood was coming. And the, the instructions regarding how to build the ark so that it would float and it would survive and everything within it would be delivered. That was a gift from God. Noah built the ark. Noah was saved by God's grace, but he had to build the ark. Turn to Joshua chapter 6. I believe this is a great passage when we talk about God's grace and how it requires conditions on our part. In Joshua chapter 6, God is giving the city of Jericho to Joshua and to the army of Israel. Here they've just crossed the Jordan River, and here's the first settlement they come to, Jericho. It is a walled city. It is well protected. But notice God says in verse 2, Joshua chapter 6 and verse 2, And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand. What is that? That's a gift. I've given the city to you. I've given the city to you, its king, and the mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all you men of war. You shall go all around the city once. This you shall do six days. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times. And the priests shall blow the trumpets. It shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn. And when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout. Then the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up every man straight before him. Do you think that the marching around the city, the vibration of those soldiers marching, the vibration of those horns blowing and the shout, do you think that's what made the walls of the city fall down flat? No, God did that. But He did not do it until they met the conditions. And when they met the conditions, that city was given to them. That's how it works. That's how grace works. We are saved by God's grace 
but we receive this gift of salvation by meeting the conditions that are set forth in the gospel. So I believe and you believe Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. We are saved by grace through faith, not of works that we contrive, not of works that we can boast of and say, God, you owe me, but through a faith that responds in obedience to what the author of eternal salvation has said we must do in order to be saved. Secondly, God's grace provides an avenue of forgiveness. And for that, we are eternally grateful. But this avenue of forgiveness given by God's grace is not to be used as a license to sin. We read in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 7, we read about the riches of of God's grace. It's interesting that in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7 that phrase is, is found as well. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. God's grace toward us as Christians is abundant. God's grace towards us as sinners before we become his children is rich and abundant. But, but God's grace towards us after becoming His children is rich and abundant as well. However, this grace in which we stand, this grace that gives us the forgiveness of our sins is not to be taken advantage of and it's not to be used as a license to sin without consequences. I understand that you have a theme for the year this year. And this theme is very well tied in with Romans chapter 6 about becoming free from sin, being set free from sin. And this is done by God's grace. In the book of Romans, Paul is talking in chapter 1 showing that the Gentiles are guilty of sin. But chapter 2, you Jews aren't any better. You're guilty of sin. Everyone's guilty of sin, chapter 3. But God can save us by sending Jesus Christ to be the propitiation for our sins. How is this salvation, how is this atonement uh, taken advantage of? Chapter 4, when we have the faith of our father Abraham, and when we respond in faith. Chapter 5 tells us that we were dead in Adam, but we are made alive in Christ, and that God, through His grace, gives us this life. Okay, we've got this grace. What are we to do with it? In chapter 6, Paul anticipates some questions. He anticipates some, some arguments that may be made. In verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? If God gives us grace, then let's continue in sin and grace is going to abound. And Paul replies, certainly not. God forbid. May it never be, depending on your translation. No, that's not how grace is to be misused. God's grace frees us from sin, and it causes us to be dead to the allurements of sin. Consider yourself to be dead to sin, dead and buried to sin. Well, verse, verse 15, he picks up another uh, suggestion, another uh, thought. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under law, but under grace? If we've died to that law, then, then, then law is no longer over us. Let's go ahead and sin. We're not under law. We're, we're under grace again. Certainly not. Salvation does not mean that we can continue to sin without consequence. It means that we are delivered from the bondage of sin and we are enslaved to Christ to serve Him in holiness. Jude addresses this misuse of grace in his epistle. In Jude 4, he writes of ungodly men who turn the grace of God into lewdness and deny the only Lord, uh, the only Lord and our Lord, only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Turning grace, turning the grace of God into lewdness. What is lewdness? This is the old King James word lasciviousness. Some of the newer translations use the word sensuality or sensual. These terms are translated from a Greek word found in this text that, that literally means an absence of restraint. 
an absence of restraint. That is, that, that understanding that we would have that tells us, no, you can't do that. That's going too far. You can't say those things. You can't do those things. You can't be in those places. Lewdness or lasciviousness says, no, nope, we're going to do it. Why are we going to do it? <clears throat> James says some people are doing it because they're saying God's grace to take care of that. All the way back in the first century, people were making that argument that we can go ahead and live however we want to and it's not going to matter because God's grace will take care of that. Have you ever heard anyone say that today? I've heard people say that today. A lot of times it's said jokingly, no, God's grace will take care of that. And they're joking about being involved in sinful activities. But if you joke about something long enough, it's no longer a joke. And sometimes, well, well-meaning well people, sometimes people who identify themselves as Christians will be involved in sinful things. And, well, don't get caught up about those things. I don't have to worry about being perfect. God's grace takes care of that. The way some people think about God's grace I believe they, they've, they've pictured God's grace that it works like an umbrella. I think we remember what an umbrella is for. We've been going through a drought up in Ohio. And so we got some rain last week, and I had to get that umbrella out. We understand what an umbrella is for. If you've got an umbrella and you're holding it over you, then that keeps you dry from the rain that is falling. Now, now picture this example, if you would, for just a moment. Imagine that you take your small children into the store to go shopping. And while you're in there, it begins to pour down rain. You can hear the rain beating on the roof in the store. And you, you shop, maybe you shop slowly, hoping that it'll quit, and it doesn't. It doesn't, so now you're finished shopping, you've got to make your way out to the car, you've got the things that you've bought, you've got your children in tow, and you've got your umbrella. Now, as long as your children stay close to you, they're going to stay relatively dry, right? But what happens if your children take off running away from you? Well, if your children are one, running away from you in a parking lot, you've got a very serious thing to deal with right there. Forget the fact that it's raining. But if your children run out away from you while you're holding the umbrella, they're going to get wet, aren't they? I think some people have the idea that God is obligated to chase them around the parking lot with the umbrella to keep them from getting wet. And that's the idea that, that they have of grace, that they mean well, but sometimes their emotions get the best of them, sometimes the temptation is too great, and they're just going to go off and do what they want to do. And in their mind, with their understanding of grace, God is chasing them around the parking lot with the umbrella so that they don't get wet. That's not the way it works. In the book of 1 John, in the book of 1 John, chapter 1, verses 5 through 7, John tells us how this works. He tells us how we as Christians can continue to enjoy our fellowship with God and how we can continue to receive the forgiveness of our sins by God's grace. And it's not by running away from God and doing whatever we want to. It's by staying as close to God as we can stay. In 1 John chapter 1, verses 5-7, through 7, This is the message which we have heard from Him and declare to you that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. That is, if we're on the other side of the parking lot playing in the mud, and we say that we're not getting dirty because God has us covered, we're lying. We're not staying where God is. We're not in the light. We're out in the darkness. And we have sin in our lives. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, if we stay as best we can where God is, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. God's grace doesn't say, you're good to go. Live however you want to live. God's grace says we stay with God 
if we want to receive the forgiveness of our sins. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12 the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us something, teaching us something about our ongoing behavior. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. That's just the opposite of lewdness. It's just the opposite of lasciviousness, which says, go ahead and do whatever you want to. God's got you covered. No, God's grace says you can't do those things. You must not do those things. You live soberly and righteously and godly in the present age. Brethren, the person who claims to be saved by God's grace, while they continually, habitually lie, cheat, steal, curse, gamble, fornicate, use drugs and alcohol, remain in an unscriptural marriage, and on and on and on we can go, they are standing in a false grace. They are not standing in the true grace of God. So Christians, yes, we sin as Christians. Yes, we do fall short of God's glory. And yes, there is an avenue of forgiveness that is given by God's grace. But that is not a license for us to sin. It is even more of a reason for us to stay as loyal to God as we can. And third, I want us to consider the error of once saved, always saved. Again, if you're talking with religious friends and neighbors, you're going to encounter this false doctrine. God's grace provides assurance to the believer. And, and we could fill these screens on these slides with verses that show how we can have assurance in our salvation. But some of our religious friends take that too far. They're influenced by Calvinism. They believe that once you become a Christian, you are forever and always saved. Yes, God's grace provides assurance to the believer, but this does not mean once we are in grace, we will automatically and unconditionally remain in a saved state. Listen to me, friends, and listen to me, brethren. The Bible clearly teaches that we can, through rebellion or neglect, either one, we can, through rebellion or neglect, depart from or fall from God's grace. Every epistle in the New Testament addresses in one way or another the importance of us remaining faithful to God for the salvation of our souls. Let's look at just a few verses. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 1 says, We then as workers together with Him also plead with you, not to receive the grace of God in vain. They had received the grace of God. When Paul went to Corinth in Acts chapter 18 and preached the gospel to them, that was God's gift to them. The opportunity for them to even hear the gospel was a gift given to them by God. And when they received it, they were saved by God's grace. But many of us know that things were not going well in Corinth. And they had to repent of a lot of misuses of their, their freedom of Christ. And they had to repent of a lot of sin that they had in that church. And if they didn't, Paul's pleading with them that if they didn't do so, they will have received God's grace in vain. What does that mean? That means that God's grace is not going to be followed through on and it's not going to, be, it's not going to deliver to them what God intends to deliver to them and that is the eternal salvation of their souls. They can be lost. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 12 and verse 15, and by the way, if once saved, always saved is true. If once you are saved in Christ, you are always saved in Christ, and you can never be lost, the book of Hebrews makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. The book of Hebrews is a masterpiece. It is written to Jewish Christians who were being persecuted for their faith, 
and they are deciding that it's no longer worth it, and they're going to go back to the law of Moses. And the writer begins in chapter 1 to make a brilliant argument after argument after argument showing that what they have in Christ is better than anything that they had in Moses, and that if they depart from Christ and go back to what they had in Moses, they are forfeiting their salvation. He writes in chapter 12, verse 15, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. How can we fall short of the grace of God? That is, we fall short of what God, through His grace, plans to give us. That's how we fall short of the grace of God. But here's, here's my favorite passage, and that's Galatians chapter 5 and verse 4. If you're talking with someone and they're advocating once saved, always saved, just remember Galatians 5, verse 4. Paul writes to these, to these Gentile Christians who are being told by Judaizing teachers, no, you've got to go back and you've got to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses and you've got to have all of this together in order to be saved. And Paul writes this letter to them in haste, no, you can't do that. Because if you do that, you are going to, and let's, let's look here, Galatians chapter 5, and at verse 4, he says, You have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. Two things in this verse that need to be understood. First is the fact that they have become estranged from Christ. What does it mean to be estranged from someone? That means that you are at enmity with someone. That means that you were once together and now you are separated. Sometimes we can speak of a couple being estranged from one another. You can't be estranged from someone that you weren't once with. If you're talking with someone who believes once saved, always saved, they will tell you that if a person who claims to be a Christian ends up being lost, they were never saved to begin with. I've had that told to me, I can't remember how many times. They were never saved to begin with. How can you be estranged from Christ if you never had Christ? You have fallen from grace. How can you fall from something that you never had? I'm not crazy about heights. God built me close to the ground, and I like to stay close to the ground. I don't like to get up on my roof. Sometimes I have to do so. But, but I, I do know this. The only way that I can fall off of the roof is if I first get up on the roof, which is one of the reasons I don't like to get up on the roof. The only way you can fall from grace is if you were in grace to start with. Oh, that can't be done. Yes, it can. We can be estranged from Christ. We can fall from grace when we try to add anything to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Whether it be the law of Moses or it be some false doctrine, that, that comes along, that, that has originated today, it'd be some philosophies, anything that we would want to attach to the gospel of Christ. We can nullify God's grace. We can fall from God's grace. These admonitions are given to Christians. 2 Corinthians, Hebrews, Galatians were written to Christians. There are two parties in our soul's salvation. Two parties are involved. God and us. And the message of the Bible is that God will do His part. God will do what He says. We had better do our part. The admonitions are for you and I to remain faithful until death. Just as our entrance into God's saving grace is conditioned on our willingness to show faith in Christ, our remaining in that saving grace is conditioned on our willingness to continue in faith. I thought of an illustration recently about salvation and about this idea of once saved, always saved. Again, as you're talking with individuals about 
about saved by grace and, and God's grace just saves completely and totally and once you're in God's grace you're forever in God's grace their concept of salvation is like a Ziploc bag once you receive God's grace then God puts you in his grace and he seals it up and nothing can ever get in and contaminate you and you can never get out because you were sealed and that gives these individuals a lot of hope it gives them a great sense of security but this is false grace God's grace doesn't work like a ziplock bag the illustration that's given to us in the scripture is that we are to run to win that we are to endure to the end that we are to compete according to the rules, but we are to stay in the race and we are to run through to the finish line. That's the condition that God has set before us in order to finally receive what God wants to offer us through His grace, and that is the eternal salvation of our souls. Brethren, grace is a wonderful Bible doctrine. It does not need to be surrendered to our religious friends and neighbors. It needs to be studied and taught. It needs to be embraced, and it needs to be enjoyed. And brethren, we need to make sure that we are standing in the true grace of God. What do you have to do in order to be saved by God's grace today? You must meet the conditions that are set forth in the gospel. You must believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You must repent of your sins. You must confess with your mouth that you believe Jesus is the Son of God. And you must be baptized in water to have those sins washed away. And then you must arise to walk in the newness of life and endure faithfully until the end. That is how we are saved by God's grace. If you're subject to the invitation, we're going to offer it at this time. If you need to do what is spelled out before you here from Scripture in order to be saved, this would be a perfect time for you to do it. If you've done that in the past but become unfaithful and need to make things right before God to, to make sure that you are in His grace, we stand ready to help you. Whatever your spiritual need is, let it be made known by coming forward as we stand and sing this invitation song.